Hello, my name is Tony and today we're going to use the full power of statistics to know how many almonds are in this box. I recently bought this box of nuts and uh, I was told in the store that half of them will be almonds and the other half will be hazelnuts. Of course I would like to know if that's true, but I don't want to count them all, that would be a lot of work. So the idea is, what if I open the pot and just grab a fistful of them and I count them? Would I be able to infer from the number of almonds and hazelnuts that I have in my hand whether actually there are 50% almonds and 50% hazelnuts in the original bowl? This is a classic problem in the statistics. Let's start with the assumption that we have half almonds and half hazelnuts. This is our hypothesis. In statistics, as in science, we work with hypotheses. Now, we get a fistful of nuts and we count them. We observed that there are 5 almonds and 3 hazelnuts. The question is, can we infer from our small sample that in the bowl there are half almonds and half hazelnuts? This question was approached by the famous mathematician Carl Pearson, one of the founding fathers of modern statistics. What he proposed is to calculate a quantity now known as the chi-square statistic. To do so, we start with the number of nuts in our sample. These are the observed counts. Then, we estimate the expected counts. In our case, since half of them are hazelnuts and the other half are almonds, we expect that out of eight, four will be almonds and four will be hazelnuts. To calculate the chi-square statistics, we square for each type of nuts the difference between observation and expectation and divide it by the expected value. If we add this quantity for all the types of nuts, we will have our statistic. What can this number tell us? Well, if the observed and expected quantities are the same, this number will follow a specific statistical distribution, the chi-square distribution, and that's why the test is called like that. If we compare the value from our samples with the actual chi-square distribution, we can calculate a p-value. How this is done is beyond this introductory lecture. The take-home message is that by comparing the observed and expected values in a sample, you can guess if your initial hypothesis is plausible or not. In our case, that hazelnuts or almonds are in the same proportion. For historical reasons, if your p-value is 0.05 or above, your initial hypothesis cannot be ruled out. If it's below 0.05, we consider that the hypothesis is wrong. In our case, that almonds or hazelnuts are in the same proportion. The smaller the p-value, the more confident we are that the observations differ from the expectations. Let's go back to our example. We have the observed values and the expected values. We also calculated our chi-square statistics. We need another thing. At this stage, you surely heard about degrees of freedom. We need to know the degrees of freedom in order to calculate the p-value. In a chi-square test, this is the number of types minus one. In our case, we have two types, almonds and hazelnuts. Therefore, we have one degree of freedom. Using the appropriate software, as we will do in a second, we will find the associated p-value. In our case, the p-value is way above 0.05, so we have no reason to doubt that half of the nuts are almonds and the other half are hazelnuts in the pot. This test is known as the chi-square test for goodness of fit, but you should be aware that there are other, more accurate tests of goodness of fit, but for now, chi-square will do most of the things you may need. To do a chi-square test, we will use a spreadsheet. In my case, I use LibreOffice, but uh, you can use also Microsoft Excel. Both are equally good. And first, we type in the information we already have, which is the number of almonds and the number of hazelnuts that we grab from the pot, so 5 and 3, and also the expected values, which is half of each, that is 4 and 4. The first thing we need to calculate is the difference between observed and expected. We square this value and divide by the expected number. And we do this for the two types of nuts. You can just scroll down here and we just add up two quantities and that will be our chi-square statistics, 0.5 as we showed before. And now the degrees of freedom. 
which as we discussed a minute ago would be the number of types, almost and isolos, this is 2 minus 1, so we have 1 degree of freedom. In order to calculate the p-value associated to the chi square, there is a function called chi dist. So we type chi dist here, we open a bracket, and then the first value would be the chi square statistic, comma, and the second value would be the number of degrees of freedom. We close the bracket, press enter, and we have the p-value associated, which is 0 0.479, etc., which is not significant at all. There is a faster way of doing all this, so the reason I show you how to do it is so you understand how this value is calculated, where this p-value comes from. But actually there is a way faster method, which is just calling a function called chi-test. So if you type chi-test, open brackets, and you just select a column, of observed values, comma, and a column of expected values. You close the bracket, press enter, and you have a straightforward the same p-value you got before. Let's try with another more biologically relevant example. You will remember from your genetics lecture that Mendel described in the pea garden two types of characters, dominant and recessive. When he crossed tall plants with dwarf plants, all the offspring was tall. That indicated that the tall character was dominant with respect to the recessive dwarf. The interesting bit comes when he crossed siblings of the first generation and found out that three quarters of the descendancy had the dominant character, tall, whilst only one quarter had the recessive character, dwarf. These experiments led him to propose the laws of heredity that we know now as Mendel laws. We can do this in a spreadsheet. So, okay, if we just write the number of observed frequencies for tall and dwarf peas in the second generation, and then we calculate here the expected frequencies, we can calculate our chi-square. So for the expected frequencies, we need first to know the total number of observed plants, and the expectation is that three quarters of the total would be tall, and one quarter would be tall. So now we have our observed unexpected. If we add up all of this, we will see the same numbers we expect. Now, as I showed you before, very easily we can just type equal, and we call the function chi test, and we put the observed column, comma, the expected and we have 0 0.436, the p-value. So we observe that actually these frequencies do not differ from the expectation of 3 quarters, 1 quarter. Let's try another example. From previous studies, you know that there are 8 different species of fly in a tropical island. You want to know if all these different species can travel the same distance at the same rate. To do so, you set up a collecting station in a boat some distance from the island. After some time, you count how many individuals come from each species. Are these numbers compatible with your expectations, that is, that all species travel the same? Okay, as before, we just introduce our data in a spreadsheet. So we have here all the species that exist in the island, and the observed counts that we get in our boat, in our collecting station. So these are all the numbers from the previous slides. Then we make sure we know the total to calculate the expected frequencies, which is just adding up all these numbers. So we have a total of 1563 individuals. And for the expected frequencies, we use the percentage we got from our knowledge of the species distribution in the island. So we know that 55% of the individuals belong to species A. So we calculate the expected frequency. The same from species B. So again, C is and for everything else and we add up, we make sure that it has the same total number, and then we can make your own chi square, very simple, chi tests, first column, second column, and this is the p-value, which is uh, largely significant, meaning that the observed frequencies are different to the expected frequencies from the island, so that we can interpret that different species travel at different paces. There is another type of chi-square test which is particularly useful, the chi-square test for independence. In this test, we want to know if two variables are associated or not. 
Imagine that you want to know whether being British is associated to drinking tea. So you can perform these simple tests. So you ask the people around you whether they are British and they drink tea, or they are British and they don't drink tea, or they are from overseas and they drink it, or from overseas and they don't drink it. So this is your table of observed frequencies. So if you want to know if there is an association between being British and drinking tea, you need to see if this counts for British and non Britons are statistically different. So how do you calculate the expected frequencies? Well, the fastest way is to calculate the total of the votes and the total of the columns and then the grand total, the total of tests, individuals. And with these numbers, you can calculate the expected frequencies this way. To know the expected values in each cell, you multiply the total of the column by the total of the row and you divide by the total number of individuals. So if you do this for each one of the cells, you will end up with a table with the expected frequencies in each category. Now, you have the observed and the expected frequencies in a simple table. This is what is called the contingency table. And it's the basis for the test of independence. You can calculate the chi-square, which is the summation of the observed minus, minus the expected frequencies squared divided expected. You do this for the four cells you have, and at the end you will get the chi-square value, which in our case is 5.81. Now you need the degrees of freedom. In a test of independence, degrees of freedom is the number of columns minus 1 multiplied by the number of rows minus 1. This is 1, okay? So having the chi-square and the degrees of freedom, you can calculate the p-value. To do a chi-square test of independence in spreadsheets, we need first to create our contingency table. First, the observed frequencies, as we discussed, and now for the expected ones, we need to calculate the sum of the rows and the sum the columns. Likewise, we get the total sum of individuals, and now we are ready to create our table with expected frequencies. Remember, for each row, we just multiply the total of the row by the total of the column divided by the total of individuals. We do this for the four cells, and we get the expected frequencies. Now, very simple tests, we just select the table of all observed frequencies and the table of expected frequencies and we get the p-value, in this case 0 0.0159, meaning that there is evidence for an association between being British and drinking tea. So, how many almonds and how many hazelnuts do I have in this pot? I'm afraid there is only one way to know for sure, but that will take a lot.